Thank you, everyone, for having me here. Um, the organizers asked me to speak a lot about PlayBuzz, to tell you about the mechanisms of the product that we build and how you could use it and how you could leverage it for your own purposes and which are our partners in the world and how they became successful and what is the revenue model, etc. But instead, I chose to tell you about something that is equally important in my opinion, and we will speak about PlayBuzz a little bit. I'm going to tell you about three main stories or thoughts that are keeping us at PlayBuzz awake at nights. We think about them all the time, and they're the core of our industry. I'm going to speak about storytelling, engagement, and the future of our revenues. But just so you can trust me and know that I'm not uh, talking anything that I'm not familiar with, I'm going to introduce my background in a little bit. And you, if you look at me as an investor, as a VC investor, you'll probably think, this guy is not crazy, okay? But those stops that you see on the screen, going through Intel as a hardware engineer, McKinsey in the United States, being a CEO of my own startup, and then at PlayBuzz, they were only stops for me looking for the ultimate consumer indulgement experience. I'm a person who wants to make people happy, and I was looking for that all the time. And I found it at PlayBuzz, because PlayBuzz is a company that creates content that people love, or helps anyone create content that people love. And basically what we do is we work with publishers and advertisers and give them formats like polls and listicles and quizzes and videos that they use to interact with their users. And this is how the magic happens, basically. One publisher uses us, then there is great engagement. So another uh, publisher uh, comes on our platform, picks it up, and it creates that circle of influence. And it happened to us in Germany almost by mistake. We had a few meetings here with Axel Springer and Hubert Burda in 2014. And very quickly, we were used by most of the media here. So it quickly expanded to RTL, Bauer Media, Gruner & Jahr, uh, Spiegel, T Online and many, many others. And basically, sorry, I'm going to spend a minute on how this works because I know that there are some technical people in the crowd who will not let me speak until I explain it and then we'll go back to the big picture. So we are a cloud platform basically that anyone can go and create content with pictures, image, uh, images, videos, text, etc. It's a simple process that, at the end of it, you take a JavaScript embed, you put it on your web pages or within an article, and it populates in a native way, and nobody can know it came from PlayBuzz. We are usually powering the news, but many times we become part of the news. And I'm giving you here an example. I created it last night from the last 48 hours. After the presidential debate in the United States, of course, many of our publishers used our poll format to sample users and ask them who they think won the debate. Donald Trump took it and he posted it on his Facebook feed. And you can see he got a, about 100,000 likes until this morning. And those that you see at the, do at the top and the hill at the bottom are our formats. And boy, this created a storm in the US media because people didn't want to believe those numbers. And I'm not going to say if they're true or false. Of course, we want them to be true, and we make sure that it is like that. Um, but, but you probably understand that this pushes the company forward every time. This is the topic of this week. Last week, in another country, someone from our community compared the politician and what that politician is saying about the future to the catalog of IKEA. And he asked users to try and differentiate who said the sentence, that politician or the catalog. Guess what? No one could differentiate. So this is what we're going through on a weekly basis, basically, at our company. But enough about us. I'm going back to those three stories that I promised to speak about. And in order to make it interesting, we're going to go through three quotes of leading, leading individuals in our industry and talk about them. So here we go. The first one is by Bob Iger, the chairman and CEO of the Walt Disney Company. And he said, consumers have lost patience. 
the media industry must make it easier for them to consume content. And this is a smart man. He also invested in Playbus. They are our key investors. And they're speaking about every one of us not having the patience to stay anymore on content and not consuming it until the end. We'll speak about that. Here is a second one about storytelling by Troy Young, Hearst Magazine's digital media president. And he's saying, he's speaking about a, you know, a ceremony, a pagan ceremony. He's saying, let's pray to the Facebook gods and open up a goat and spread the entrails over the table to figure out what's the right way to construct a headline. What he's basically saying is that no one has control over what Facebook is doing and how much traffic it's going to send to anyone. It's like forecasting the weather, for lack of a better example. Here's the last one about revenues. By the CEO, by Mark Thompson, the CEO of the New York Times. Here's what he's saying. He's saying winter really is coming for many of the world's news publishers. And this is one of the you know, most popular terms on the web. Um, and people really relate to that. And he's speaking about the standard ad units that publishers are using and why this is not going to be helpful anywhere to, to anyone. Okay, so let's go back to Bob Iger and what he said about consumers losing patience. And this is not news to any of you. You know that already. You know it because you are pinging around with your articles, and you know it because you know that simple but evil button, the read more button. It was created because today, there are more people who don't read an article until the end than people who do. The actual number is 80%. 80% of you, or you at 80% of the times, will never read an article until the end. And what it means is that if a publisher is relying on banners or videos at the bottom of this, they're not viewable to anyone. And I put two examples here that I really like. One of them is from the last few days by the Atlantic Media. It's on Quartz, okay? And you can probably see the Read More button. This is a long-form article publisher. This is the only thing they do. They create a lot of text. And they're speaking about Disney trying to buy Twitter. It's very interesting. This, these are huge news. Of course people will want to read that. But the default here is that you wouldn't. On the left-hand side, a poll on Social Times. This is on Edweek, okay? the place where advertisers go to consume their news. Even they don't read until the end. Even they don't believe in the model. And this is the entire internet right now. It's happening because consumers are getting used to the right-hand side, okay? This is high-definition 4K TV compared with black and white television. And those consumers are not only millennials. By the way, millennials are getting gold already, okay? It's all of us when we're speaking to our families, when we're consuming content that is pushed to us on social networks. We like it colorful. We enjoy it. And if publishers, traditional publishers, want to continue interacting with consumers, they need to adopt some of the principles that are used on the right-hand side. They need to think more about engagement. So if you go to any publisher, and, and Jeremy here from The Post will speak about how they look at their metrics. You will see that first and foremost, they're looking at unique users, page views, and revenue per thousand users, RPMs. But those metrics could run the risk of being superficial because you can quickly hack them and they don't indicate whether you're going to survive or not. And our recommendation to the entire industry, that's what we push as a company, and we're doing projects, like we're, we're putting a lot of OPEX just to educate publishers on this, is to focus on engagement. Engagement as in staying longer times on pages, or reading them until the end, or consuming the content until the end, or doing something with the content, like sharing it, or answering a question, making something that is personal. That is engagement. And if the industry doesn't go there, it will be very dangerous for traditional publishers. Here is the second story that I'm going to speak about, which is storytelling. So remember the goat that we sacrificed and we put on the table? 
basically Facebook is doing whatever they want and they're entitled to do that okay they're a free company uh, they're not in any contracts with the media industry and they're trying to do the best for their audience but the facts are scary if you look at how much social traffic those admirable publishers received between Q1 this year and Q2, you see a drop of about 25 to 50%. And that is crazy for a publisher. It's crazy because social traffic is now almost 50 or more percent from our overall traffic. We're very dependent on Facebook. And publishers are not able to control those numbers at all. So the solution is that many publishers are trying to not rely on Facebook, to try and distribute on multiple distribution platforms. And this model is very different from what you used to know. So in the past, like 25 years ago, we either owned our own trucks for newspapers to send them in the morning to our houses, or provided set-top boxes on the TV to control the content, the distribution, and the monthly subscriptions. This is no longer going to happen. Media companies will become storytellers per se, nothing more. And they will need to adapt themselves, we will need to adapt ourselves to the different distribution platforms. And I, I put here just a few examples. So social platforms, of course, whether Snapchat is very different from Facebook, or messaging apps that you can use messaging bots, and we'll speak about this in a second, or content aggregators. How many people here, by show of a hand, know what this is this Chinese word no one okay this is a company called Tochiao they're worth 20 billion dollars already in China and they just started this month to conquer the West what they did basically was to create an app like Apple News that learns what users like they did a deep learning machine they created and trained it on over a billion users okay and now when they test it in the United States and in Brazil, it also works in other languages. And this is the future of all of us. And the message here is, let's focus on how we make this great on other platforms. Think about Coca-Cola. So in the past, you could have, uh, you know, you could have got like a small can on an airplane or a glass bottle in a restaurant or a paper glass in a football game. Or if you go to Walmart, it's a two liter bottle. That's how we need to think about content. We need to serve it in different containers and adapt it to our users wherever they are. And this is what some publishers are doing. And I'm sure Jeremy will speak more about this in the next talk. Uh, I just brought to you an example from uh, News Corp from The Sun in England. And they are our partners. And I spoke with uh, Emma Thompson, who ran this experiment. And basically, what they wanted to achieve, they wanted to engage their audience in different ways. And they knew that they have many niche audiences and they can't just push them notifications through the application. You can only do that for an earthquake or for a famous leader saying something, but not for football and not for Manchester United. So basically they created a bot, a chat bot, and they invited users like me to select their favorite team. And this is me, this is my session. And the bot is asking me, what's my first favorite team? And I just wrote menu, okay? Because I'm lazy. I don't want to write Manchester United. And I'm skeptic about this bot able to engage me. But what happened is that it identified Manchester United. And every day at 5 p.m., when I'm supposedly uh, going home, although I'm not, it sends me an article about the transfer window and what players are leaving the team and what players are coming in. And this is super interesting. The results are saying that. The, um, the Sun are uh, reporting, and that's what Emma told me, that 23% of the users return daily. 23% come back. 60% return weekly. This is huge for them. This is something that is very different from Facebook. When they randomly get a user, like their number of pages per user per month is not very far from the number of uniques. And they're trying to turn that situation into something more meaningful for them. So that's just one example about distribution. Um, you want to take a picture? Here, please. <laughs> OK. The last story. 
but we have to speak about revenues. I was told not to speak about revenues here, but we have to. Revenues are the lifeblood of the industry. And we spoke earlier about our reliance on page views and how risky it is. And it is risky because it sets our valuations. So when you think about famous acquisitions in the last few years of media companies, the Washington Post going to Bezos for a quarter million dollars, the Huffington Post going for 350 to AOL. This is a company that went from a billion dollars to zero in a year, Mode Media. And just a week and a bit ago, they went into chapter seven, okay? They collapsed one day. Are there any Borda people in the crowd? Okay, I'm asking, I'm not, I'm not mocking everyone. I'm asking this because it was a Borda decision as far as I understand to close the company because the company didn't perform well. And reportedly what happened is that they were so reliant on Facebook that when their page use exposures declined by about 20 or 50%, their revenues declined. And it's like a factory that loses a big client, it all collapsed. And the company no longer exists. And this is very dangerous. This could be the future of all of us. Uh, you saw Mark Thompson and what he said. If you go and read the entire article he put there, he speaks about the need to change the revenue model in the industry. And many publishers, what they're doing, and I'm not going to steal the thunder of the next uh, talk, they're creating studios. They're becoming agencies. And those agencies are creating wonderful stories. One, they can innovate the product. Two, they're publishers. They are storytellers. And three, they hire talented design people who really get it and can really engage the user with a brand. This is not an ad. This is a branded story. And users love those stories. We know because that's what we do as a commercial model ourselves. The problem with this model is that it's very linear. The advertising industry, I heard Scott Spirit speaking. He's the chief uh, digital and strategy officer of WPP. He said that the, the advertising industry has a margin of 15%, okay? That's why Google doesn't buy any of the ad agencies. Basically, it's a highly linear model. And this is why there is a risk that this revenue model would not take off. Because one, there is a transaction friction. Every time you need to sell a campaign again and again and again. Two, there are creative challenges you need to create and create. And three, there is an ad ops infrastructure question of how you really run this thing at scale. So we at PlayBuzz are thinking about those issues every day. And part of our offering or part of what we're working on is to try to solve all of these. I'm going to speak now for a couple of more minutes about how we can help anyone who's either a writer or an entrepreneur who has a business and wants to engage users with content. And the formula is very, very simple, okay? You go to our website, which is open to anyone, to any community member, and you can go and, as I showed earlier, create your own content. We have an academy on our site that will instruct you through how to learn best practices and how to create the most uh, intriguing content for your audience. Then you simply embed it on any site. I provided just four examples here from Germany. So you see Red Bull Build, Sport 1 and Stern. Uh, each one of them writes about different content verticals. This is not by all means only for entertaining content. It's for any type of content. And you will find the formats that are a good fit with your audience. The secret sauce here is to drive engagement. And this is why PlayBuzz basically is successful and exists. You see at the top the average engagement metrics of the industry. So for example, 15 second sessions. Well, when you use our formats, we expect you to meet the benchmark of a minute and a half to three minutes of engagement. Or if you look at completion rates, completion rates are the opposite of bounce rate. Bounce rate is that metric that Google can punish you for and Facebook will punish you for. What we do basically is we'll help you take all your users from the moment they landed on a content articles to the end. And our numbers are about 85 to 95% completion rate. And then the last part is share rate. I don't want you to think about PlayBuzz or in general about Facebook as your 
you know, most important thing. But you do want your users to interact with your content. And sharing, clicking on the share button, is one sort of an interaction. And we see an interaction rate of about 5 to 10%, like sharing the article or converting into uh, a brand site after taking an item. The average share rate of the industry is about 0.2%. Here's the last bit. You can't do it uh, with voodoo, OK? This is not a process that you need only a smart, creative person. No. It's data driven. And we provide you in a free way. Anyone could go. You don't need to pay, OK? We decided as a company to open it to the entire industry, unless you're an advertiser. You can go to our platform, and once you publish your content, you can quickly learn how good it is. What is your conversion flow and how it compares to the benchmark? How many social views did you get? In what questions did you ask, for example, in a quiz, your users fell off a cliff because the question was too difficult or annoying? And this is what we encourage you to do. Go explore your data and learn how to make it better. Thank you very much. Um, so we are open for your questions now, but uh, I kick it off as well. Um, so the content Playbus uh, promotes is actually created by the users or the publishers, but what was the most shared, the most liked Playbus story ever about? Wow. Do okay. you know? Or maybe one um, of the top five. Yeah, uh, okay, yeah. So I'll actually give you an interesting story. So <laughs> one of the most shared pieces was in our early days when we were focused only on entertainment before we touched news, sports, or any other vertical. And it's interesting because the company was about to go bankrupt. And we had only about $50,000 left in the bank. And that our CEO thought what he should do. One option was to do like a business development act and, for example, go to Axel Springer, white label the entire platform, and just be you know, in a license agreement. But he decided not to do that because we're a risk-taking company and he hired the chief editor. And that chief editor basically started creating content and tagging uh, you know, celebrities on Twitter and trying to interact with celebrities on Facebook. And what happened is that throughout that process, we grew from about 1,000 users a day to like 10,000 users a day. And then they released a piece called, Who Are You at Your Past Life? Okay? Now, I, I can't believe that something like that could be shared so many times. But people really know, you know, they want to know what they were in their past lives. And I think that in one day, we got over a million users. Uh, and that piece got, uh, throughout the entire time, across all publishers, about 20 or 30 million shares. Okay. It was translated to many languages. That's interesting. I thought celebrity weddings, actually, or something like that. But No. Nope. Yeah. Politicians okay. as well people are, are not People are more deep-minded than you think. Um, any questions from the audience? Okay, I have another one uh, for the time being. Uh, do you actually have an, an editorial staff that creates content, for instance, for the German market? Okay, so we ourselves do not create content as a business practice, but we do have editorial staffs. It's about one-third of the company. Actually, some of them are over there by the door. Um, Hi there. And basically, we do that because we understand that it's not enough to build the software. Okay, putting it out there would not help publishers or community members write great content. So we work together with uh, our community to develop that content and we create best practices. If we go to a big publisher um, anywhere in the world, we could set up a project together. We would even sit together with that publisher and only editorial people will work with the editorial staff of that publisher. Okay, some questions now? Don't be shy. <laughs> Okay. Um, as I said, uh, Playbus is actually called the fa Facebook giant you don't know because uh, you might not even recognize uh, uh, a Playbus feature as a Playbus one because you find it anywhere from MTV to CNN to Build now even. Um, yeah. <laughs> what was the question I wanted to ask about that? Ah, yeah. Um, are, the, uh, are there actually um, numbers on how many publishers worldwide are using Playbus? Yes, that's a good question. So the official number is 12,000 publishers, and it's a huge number that we were constantly growing. And at one point, we understood that it doesn't matter if we got to 15 
or 20,000. And what we're doing right now is trying to focus on the top three or five publishers in every market and really help them think about engagement in a meaningful way.